um, we call our system global table of structure and it, it uses a deep learning framework for both um, for joint table identification and the cell structure recognition um, using visual context. And the visual context is what gives the name uh, global in our global table extractor. And it's worked with uh, many people, including uh, one of our interns uh, who didn't build on. Um, and we are, uh, most of us are at IBM Research Elden, all of us are mostly our IBM research, um, and we are in um, sunny, Cal sunny California in San Jose. Uh, if you ever get the chance to come and visit, it's actually a really beautiful campus. Um, we're in the middle of the uh, middle of a mountain, and I see wild turkey and deer running around all the time, and cows. So it's a very unique working location, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, okay, so let's get started. So um, for some of you who work in table, uh, table related work, you probably already know this, but um, not many people realize that actually tables are a really a popular data representation um, type. Um, and it's used in across business, science, um, including things like invoices, government reports, financial reports, scientific papers, uh, loan agreements, or contracts in general. And they, as you can see from these examples, there are, there's actually a really big variety of tables, um, how they look, what kind of content they have. It's not what, um, you know, the Excel tables that you might be thinking about that have fully graphical lines and just kind of one line and a few numbers around. Um, there's actually a really big variety. And um, I, I love my, my colleague's example of, um, you know, I'll, there are some office workers out there whose sole job is to make tables look very engaging. So they spend a lot of effort and put a lot of creativity into these tables, which in turn actually makes it very hard for uh, machines to understand them, but uh, that's what we'll get to. <laughs> um, and, you know, as I just mentioned, they are, I would uh, argue, easy to understand, but for humans. Um, and part of that reasoning is, you know, we make it compact and we know what humans are able to understand and there's a shared understanding, but um, it's often the case, I think, especially in computer vision, that the easier it is to understand for humans, the harder it is for us to build a machine or algorithm to also process it. Um, um, so let me um, do a little set of the actual problem definition that we're covering here today with our uh, system and our talk. Um, so given a document, and this could be um, in PDF or image or office doc, um, we want to be able to extract the um, tabular information um, in a structure representation. And by structure, I mean that there are, there's a table border for each table. There's a, you can partition the table contents into cells. And we know the vertical and horizontal alignment of all the cells. So what row number it is, what column number it is. And by the way, if anyone's ever confused or want to ask questions, uh, feel free to go ahead um, and uh, let me know uh, during the presentation. Um, and then kind of want to talk a little more in depth about the PDF document format um, because it is very popular, uh, used by people to share documents and data with each other. Um, and part of the reason is because we can trust that when someone else opens it, um, they will uh, very likely see the exact same document. Um, but um, I think that's another trade-off where the more certain you are that other people are going to see the same document, the less likely it is to be a structured document. And it is a case here in PDFs. Um, what a PDF file actually is, is um, location information for each letter or each character or symbol on the page. So there's actually no even any concept of a word in PDF documents, um, which actually I think is surprising for a lot of people, including me when I first started. Um, and so this is even in programmatic PDFs, all you have are these character locations. So there's no concept of what is a table or what, like what's, how things are organized together. Um, it just tells you where to draw things. And, um, and this is important because there are trillions of PDFs in existence and it's always, it's rapidly growing all the time because of uh, such a popular um, data format. Um, and now is when people are kind of going back to some of their older um, documents that are only in PDF format. It may have started out as maybe a Word document or something more structured, 
But now um, a lot of businesses, they have these PDF documents that they want to be able to analyze information from and they can't without having workers manually transcribe them into a structured format, which is what a lot of people's jobs are as well. Um, and part of the challenge in doing automated um, table extraction is that there is such a variety um, in tables. Um, you can see here there are some that have graphical lines, but some that only have um, tabbing or visual spacing clues. There are some complex tables here, you know, at first look, the, it might be hard to tell. It's those three tables or one or two. Um, and it might uh, be subjective just depending on what the downstream task is on um, how many tables there are here. Um, and there could be uh, ones with lots of textual content. There could be some that are uh, interleaved with charts or sometimes um, actually one big problem too is a lot of charts and figures can look a lot like tables. Um, and, uh, and there can also be, I think this is even harder when it comes to table understanding, but nested row headers or uh, column headers. And there are also sometimes nested tables, um, which are even tougher. So when I started on um, this problem around uh, one and a half years ago, two years ago at IBM Research, um, I come from more of a computer vision background. Um, and for me, when I saw this problem, the first thing I thought of is to be able to um, it is that tables and cells are like objects on a page. Um, so why don't we leverage the previous work um, that uh, the, the great work, you know, improvements recently um, in deep learning for object detection. Um, so essentially see these as um, tables and cells, uh, sorry, as uh, um, similar to bikes and cars, uh, tables and cells. Um, but one big issue is where do we get the data for this? Um, as I said, table extraction is very um, tedious and, uh, sorry, uh, doing manual transcription is very tedious. Can I have a question? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So there is obviously some similarity, like what the task you want to do with objects, but like that structure may be like, <coughs> the content in table will be like for an object, like we know that the ball will look similar, like a football will look similar everywhere. It won't change much in uh, like the features and all, but in the table, the text is totally different kind of thing. And the table length, height, <coughs> width, number of columns, number of rows, and even the structure as you explained can vary. So how can you like, what is the like <coughs> analogy in terms of like object recognition and this? Uh, just is because like we want to have a bounding kind of thing or is there more apart from that? Right. So going back to this um, picture, so I would argue that um, in natural scenes, um, objects can look very different too, right? Even for a person's detection, people can look very different. We are of all shades and color and sizes, right? Um, so similar to tables, you're right. They can be well, two column, one column, right? Um, be very large, very tall. Um, but it, um, with enough training data, it seems like those can be covered because there's still something very vis visually salient about tables, right? Like I can blur out all of this text and we only have the structure left and you can still kind of tell as a human that this is a table, correct? So there's still something, but I, I like what you're getting into and I'm about to talk about that in a couple slides. There are some things that are very interesting about tables that kind of are different from natural images. That being, you know, text um, can be, it can be arbitrarily long, right? Whereas objects, it, they tend to be a certain kind of squarish size. Um, so I'll, I'll address how we kind of exploit that to uh, improve our network. Oh, sure. Thank yeah. you. Good question though. Uh, but first, we have to figure out how to get the data. Um, so one, um, so as I was saying, it's it's uh, there isn't a lot of um, data out there. There's some, and starting to be more um, that are labeled with table boundaries. Um, really, not a lot when it comes to cell boundaries. Um, so what we actually did. Um, so this is, I think, a very interesting. Um, um, uh, what's the right word? Um, kind of a serendipitous find. Um, so we, uh, funny enough, we actually discovered this at the same time as another group at IBM, and then we decided to combine our forces. But um, in scientific papers, 
Um, they are often published in two formats, in PDF and also HTML. And HTML is structured. So if you look at the table tag in the HTML code, it shows the exact structure. Um, that, um, so knowing that there's this correspondence, we can actually write um, token-based matching so we can get all of this label data for free. Um, and uh, there, the pub tabnet data set was kind of around similar time when we discovered this. And they, the originally the data set had uh, 568,000 tables, but only the table, um, uh, the, only the table label and also the, the structure, but not the cell bounding blocks, which is what you would need if you want to do an object recognition approach to this uh, problem. So we actually combined forces and we also did the cell annotation the matching. Um, so this is a fully annotated, automatically generated data set of about half a million tables um, from scientific tables. Um, additionally, um, we also found that there's a similar kind of correspondence in financial um, documents, which are actually quite important for IBM as well, since we have a lot of finan uh, financial customers. Um, and this data set is automatically um, compiled from annual financial reports and um, Edgar of uh, S&P 500 companies um, that are matched with the Edgar um, reports uh, that are in HTML. Um, so similar deal, we have the table boundary and also the cell boundary um, of more than 110,000 tables. Um, I am actually just in the process of um, working with IBM to release it now. So that should be available very soon. Um, so given that this data, um, you know, you'd think the first thing to do is just to fine tune the existing object sectors with these new classes. Um, but it, uh, we, we tried that, but the results were actually quite poor. Um, and we were quite surprised why it'd be so bad um, for, you'd think that with fewer classes, the results could potentially improve. Um, and then we really kind of thought about what tables are like, and this is why uh, the motivation for a more specialized table and cell detection, uh, sorry, cell uh, detector. Um, so kind of what uh, Vivek was alluding to, um, tables and cells have very different sizes and aspect ratios. So you could have a super long um, cell like this, right, or you can have a very squarish cell. Um, and for uh, RedNet, for a um, one-shot kind of object detection algorithm like RedNetNet or YOLO, they work by using uh, anchor boxes. Uh, but you can only have so many anchor boxes before your um, your model just blows up in size. And then that's usually um, figured out. Like they figure out the anchor box sizes based on the distribution of sizes in the uh, training data. Um, but because tables and cells have very different sizes, we can't accommodate for both. Um, so we decided to have a special, like a one for table and one for cell. But we still want to connect these two together because cells and tables have um, you know, some relationship with each other. Um, in particular, uh, we realized that cells are always inside tables and tables always contain cells. It's kind of part of the definition. Right, you can't have a cell in the middle of nowhere that's not contained inside a table, and a table without any cell, I guess it's a blank, <laughs> just a blank page. So, um, and that's I think a very um, interesting fact about tables that we um, then exploit. Um, so, in our table detection framework, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a object detector for tables and object detector for cells. How we kind of connect them together is we have this um, penalty loss uh, for the object detector for tables, where we um, use the uh, cell detector to figure out how many, uh, how dense the cells are. And for the tables that are detected uh, during training that really don't have a lot of cells, we have given extra penalty. Um, so this helps get rid of very unrealistic tables. And this really actually helps uh, filter out a lot of the um, uh, charts and, and figures. Um, and we also have this um, other part where during inference time, um, for usual um, object detection um, and a lot of computer vision tasks, um, non-max suppression is used when you have overlapping um, candidates like this. 
um, just take the one that is has the highest confidence and suppress the ones around. Um, instead of doing that, we could do something smarter because we know where the cells are. So we actually had to find a kind of a, a tableness um, criteria based on the density of cell inside and just outside the table um, to be able to re-rank very similarly confidence, uh, sorry, uh, tables that are overlapping with similar confidences. And finally, we output the table boundary um, in, in this uh, step. Um, Right, uh, so let's talk about the penalty loss in, in detail. Um, so we would give this extra penalty loss um, if the detection um, is, if it says there's a table but contains very little cell mask um, inside the bounding box as detected by the cell detector. And it's also, um, if it's not a table but it contains a lot of cells, um, then we also give a penalty um, for that. Um, and for the re-ranking, um, what we mean by tableness is should have lots of cellular regions inside and should not have a lot of cellular regions just outside that is not being covered already by a non-overlapping uh, other table box region. Um, yeah, so hopefully those make sense. Um, to show um, kind of what I mean, this is a... Um, one potential output of um, table, uh, sorry, without um, any re-ranking or non-max suppression. Um, and part of it is that, you know, there could be a lot of potential subtables inside a table. Um, but after we apply our re-ranking criteria, we end up with the correct um, overall large table here. Um, and we show that we have actually good detection on modern as well as archival documents uh, where we actually didn't do any fine tuning. Um, so we we're actually pretty, uh, pretty pleasantly surprised by the result. Um, this is a, actually a collaboration with uh, University of Reading on the old climate data um, with, um, with text, sorry, with um, public records from the early 1900s that are printed, but actually um, difficult to extract at this point with um, other uh, table, available table extraction uh, algorithms out there. Um, in terms of quantitative results, um, we show that we are performing state of the art on ICDAR 2013 and 2019. Um, 2013 kind of has been the competition that a lot of work has been comparing themselves against. And then there's the more recent competition in 2019. Um, some of the key differences between the two competitions is that 2013 is purely based on programmatic documents, which means that they're actually using character level recall. So if you get a table that you know, is missing, um, is, uh, has extra white space, for example, it'll still be counted as correct, as long as it doesn't include extra text and vice versa. If you miss some text, then that's bad, but if you just miss white space, it's okay. Whereas for ICTAR 2019, um, it, because they're all scan documents, they actually use a purely computer vision uh, metric of intersection over union. Um, I actually don't like it as much because uh, in the sense that if you include extra white space, even if it's just a little bit bigger, it can be punished in the final score. Um, even though I think in practice that doesn't actually matter. Uh, but we do quite well on both, um, uh, especially on the 2013 and 20, um, and uh, okay, so now moving on to the next step of actually getting the structure, uh, the cells in the structure. Um, another insight that we had was that tables can come in many different styles, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, but object detection models are um, known to mostly focus on local areas and can't always handle the nuances of a global table style. And what I mean by that is um, looking at this table, for example, if you only have a very small field of view and then you see these graphic lines, um, in this case, from the global view, we know that, oh, you see the graphic lines, so let's just stick, use those as the major clue to figure out that this is its own cell. But if you were to make the same assumption here, then you would be wrong because it's actually the graphic lines help, but it's also not everything, right? There are some cells some cells within that. So it's important to look at it globally to try and figure out um, what kind of style it is. And then that will help determine 
Um, and we actually found that when we have more data with many different styles mixed together when we train, it can actually lead to a lower performance um, just because it, I, I think it's because it confuses the model to figure out like whether to rely on certain things as clues or not. Um, so this is our um, subsection framework. Uh, we have a hierarchical model to deal with this problem of different kinds of um, uh, styles. Um, so we have a, so after we get the table network to produce the table boundary, uh, we have an attribute set that tries to classify images uh, with and without graphical lines. Uh, so to figure out whether it has graphical lines or not, you can imagine there could be a lot more styles, um, but the one we focus on that is I think most common is to look at uh, the presence of graphical lines. Um, and then we have two different networks that are specialized for whether there are graphical lines or not. Um, and um, once we have the cell location, that's actually not enough to give the actual structure because we still don't know which cells are in the same column or in the same row together. Um, and to be able to do that, um, we actually use a, um, a clustering method. Um, and the roughly at a super high level, what we do is First, we have to figure out the number of rows and columns in the table. And to do this, we sample at each of the horizontal and vertical locations. Um, and then we also need to determine the alignment uh, for the columns and rows. Um, and this is, um, again, kind of based on the box locations to figure out if they're left aligned, right aligned, or center aligned. And then we use k-means clustering um, with the number of clusters, a uh, center, sorry, number of centers based on the number of rows and columns. Um, sorry, we do clustering based in two directions, vertical and horizontal. Um, and then we, depending on the alignment we find, um, we put the um, boxes in the um, cluster. So if it's, for example, if it's center aligned, then it's very easy. We just use the cluster centers, whichever is closest. Um, but if it's left aligned, then we have to figure out where the left cutoff point is and then put all the cells based on that. Um, and finally, we assign these cell boxes, um, as I was saying earlier, um, to each of the rows and columns. Um, and in terms of qualitative results, um, I think we show- uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. So can you go back? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. So have you tried to use like something like within a table is also a table, like something like that? like. The same thing which you are using with bounding boxes. Like <clears throat> if I only take like, uh, for example, there's a table with eight comma eight, like eight rows, eight columns. Okay. Then six comma six from any location is also a table. Two comma two from any location is also a table. Like something like, <clears throat> and try to basically have like, use this constraint also for basically, like basically getting more cell alignment or something, or just like doing it over eight comma eight could be good enough, something. Um. I think I don't quite understand what you mean. So, so I want to say like within a table is also a table. So if I take a partial al alignment of columns also like eight comma. So if the table is eight comma eight, mm -hmm. I can take any four comma four cross there in anywhere in that thing. That is also a table. So that can also help me in alignments because that's itself is a kind of a table. Oh, I think I see what you mean. Um, I think if we, you want to do that approach, I think it's easier to just do the, um, there are also some algorithms out there that do um, column and row detection instead okay. of cell detection. Okay. So they try and detect column by column and row by row. But I would say that the disadvantage to both of these um, um, strategies is that there are things like, for example, cells that span multiple columns and rows. Okay. And there are also um, sometimes just very weird tables where it's not even that it spans that, but it's just a little bit off. So there's just a little bit outside of a certain like column and row. Okay. Um, yeah, so there are some special cases where I think that doesn't work yeah. so well. Yeah. yeah. If there's some merging in some cells, then obviously if you choose that, then it will be not so beneficial. I makes sense. Yeah, but there are definitely, yeah, it, it, there's some people who kind of go with that approach for sure. Um, Right, so um, um, at, uh, so quality of results. Um, so I picked these examples. These are from ICDR 20, uh, 2013 competition. 
um, to show that although in this case, for example, we did our cell structure was not completely correct. Part of the problem is I think that the text is just too long. So you have to regress a lot for that anchor box. Um, but because of the way that the text is extracted, we can still get the correct structure in the end. Um, we don't have to cut things off just because the table boundaries, sorry, the cell boundary cut it off there. So there are some things we can do um, to fix um, cell, uh, cell bounding box errors. You still have the right structure. Um, and in terms of quantitative measure, first um, just talk quickly about the metric. Um, so this is uh, the, both competitions are based on adjacency relationship. And uh, what I mean by that is um, given, this, so this is a ground truth table. And if this is the um, predicted table, um, here you can see that it has an extra few cells in between. Um, so if you were to naively go with a metric where you just look at every cell and does it have the correct row and column number, then it would actually punish all of these cells, even though this, these structures are more or less correct. So with adjacency relationships, you look at um, their, each cell and its neighbors and see if they're still neighbors in the, um, reckon, in the predicted table. Um, in the ICTAR 2013, because it's using text, it actually uh, matches the cells based on just the text content. And ICTAR 2019, it's based on bounding box IOU of the cell bounding boxes, which again, I don't, I'm not a big fan of just because um, you could be just a little bit off in the bounding box than what they think the ground truth is, like if you're a little bit bigger. Um, and then it can be counted as zero, like uh, incorrect, just because they don't think that's a match. Um, and for small text boxes, like it could be very easy. You could just be off by a couple pixels and then it'll, the IOU could be too low. Um, <clears throat> so our, we again show safety art results for ICTAR 2013 and 2019. Um, this is track B for the modern documents. Um, and I, so we have two different conditions. One is using, uh, no GT means not using the uh, ground truth table boundary. Uh, this is using our own table boundary um, extracted from our um, table, <clears throat> sorry, extracted from our table network um, or using the ground truth boundary. And in both cases, we um, beat the previous day of the art. Um, and just to show um, some of the different uh, ablation studies we did, um, the detection base is using, um, sorry, it is uh, the one where it's a retina net and then doing both um, cell and table section at the same time. And you can see the performance is much lower. Um, and then for the cell style um, mix, no pre-training is saying, what if we don't have the big, um, what we did with the automated um, cell bounding box annotations. If we don't have that, um, the accuracy also drops. Um, and then the cell style mix is the one where uh, I was saying you mix all the different um, documents together and see what the accuracy is. And cell border is what if the GT cell is only trained on the ones with the border uh, style. And you can see that both are lower than the when we use them together. And then for um, 2019, I just kind of want to point out kind of my little um, criticism of the IOU. Um, so in the 0.1 IOU case, which when I qualitatively look at it, it looks exactly correct. It's much more higher than the IOU 0 0.5, 0 0.6, um, just because it's you're including a few extra pixels of white space that doesn't actually matter when it comes to outputting the actual table structure. Um, kind of talking about some uh, example use cases, I mentioned earlier our collaboration on the historical weather tables. Can I have a question? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in the last thing, mm -hmm. last slide. Oops, sorry. Uh -huh. So uh, in ICDR 2013, you also evaluate if the text is right. Uh, whereas in ICDR 2019, you only was worried about the structure. If I'm right, like 
One That's correct. Thing. In that case, there there's no text output. You only output the bounding box. Oh, you only output the bounding box. Okay. That's so, right. So thirteen is a I think a harder task. Like if maybe you get the bounding box right, but some like if some text are shifted by one one row or something like then it will be one cell or something. Then it will be incorrect. Yeah. So I think it's hard to say one is better than the other. Um, but I will. I I am. I do like 2013 better, but one problem with 2013 is that it was a relatively small data set. Um, okay. The it's it's pre deep learning era, so in fact the yeah. uh, the test set is bigger than the training set, <laughs> and the test set I think was only like 96 um, pages, so okay. it's it's not a lot. Um, and then for 2019, they have two different types of um, documents. Some are archival, so it's actually handwritten documents, and some are modern. But in the data set itself, they do not provide the text either, because I think they themselves didn't, you'd have to use OCR to be able to get that text. And for the handwritten, it's probably impossible, actually. Even as a human, I couldn't read what they were, what it said. <laughs> oh, okay. And <clears throat> one more thing, like, for example, like, if I, let's assume, like, I have a clean table where the text is written well and all, can I use something like, so, for example, we know in a column, all things are numbers. For example, there's a column with years mm -hmm. as there, mm -hmm. like 2014 or some date column. Then can I use that information? Like in this row, the semantically similar things are there. So they should be aligned in some single row. Like this is one column. Have you yes. thought of something using this kind of uh, structure based on semantics or the type of column it is to... Yeah, that's a great idea. And that's what we're working on now, kind of incorporating okay. actual language. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. To, to assist with, um, to, to just uh, have better extractions, right? And some of that, I would say, um, that's even more crucial. Let me go back a little bit. Um, some things, especially for things like this, were thresholds for releases. Okay. Um, in this case, it's obvious that it um, spans three columns because of uh, for like the the, um, the bounding box spans all three columns, right? Yes. But yes. you can imagine there are some cases where the word might be very short. It mm. could just be like variable and then just in the middle. So how do you know if it spans the cells or not below? And the only way I think uh, one way, I guess, if it's a fully graphical line, then and you know that it's fully graphical line, then you can use a graphical line, or you really need uh, natural language understanding, right? You need to know that this is some a category, a, a meta category that applies to everything below it. Yes. Uh, and yeah, so that in those cases, definitely, and also there's still errors, right? Um, it's hard to be perfect for every single style, so having that additional um, natural language component can help. In fact, actually, we already kind of use a little bit of it in, um, uh, I don't show it here, but sometimes there are multi-text um, lines and sometimes our cell bounding box gets it wrong and cuts and, uh, and over splits. Um, so we actually use the natural language understanding to figure out should they be concatenating together again or not. Okay, thanks. No problem. Um, okay, so, um, so there's the weather table collaboration, and we also, um, uh, I don't know how many of you here are familiar with the CORD-19 data set um, that was out a few, uh, a few months ago at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, from AI2, uh, where we, where it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, data set of um, COVID, uh, coronavirus-related uh, scientific papers that's actually constantly being um, updated with the latest um, uh, with the latest papers. And it was also there was also a company in Kaggle competition, and this was supported by many companies, um, including uh, also the White House. Um, when it first came out, we actually uh, we were excited and took a look at the data set, and we were uh, a little surprised to find that all the tables in the papers were just gone. Like there was no representation of them at all in the in their um, uh, JSON files. And we actually reached out to them. Um, and after some um, discussions, it turns out that they tried to extract tables from these those PDF documents, but the result was just so poor that they couldn't include it in there. 
Um, so we um, decided to collaborate and um, we ended up, and, and it was actually the number one requested content on the Kaggle contest, because you can imagine for, especially for like biological papers, um, a lot of the results are in the tables, right? For computer science papers too. And yes, the author in the text might summarize it a little bit or talk about important points, but I think the point of having um, machine readers is to be able to get all that information that a human might miss. Um, so yeah, so we uh, collaborated and we built a service where we use GTE to uh, ingest um, documents that they give us and then we uh, get back the tables that they, then gets incorporated into their um, into their uh, doc, uh, sorry, into their documents. There's still we're still working on some issues with how to merge different parses, um, and some that's why some of the tables, unfortunately, we extract correctly, but are still missing um, in the final output. Um, but yeah, we're very uh, I'm very happy to help, even if it's just a little bit, in the COVID nineteen effort. Um, and it's nice to see GT make a difference as well. Um, talking a little bit about what's next, um, so I think on top of what uh, Vivek mentioned with uh, incorporating um, semantics, uh, we also really want to incorporate user feedback uh, because not only is it just a hard problem in general to have a table extraction um, system that works for everything, that there can be subjectivity depending on what users need. Um, so right now we're working on this tool that will easily allow users to correct the what we give them um, from GTE, um, easy interface to use, and then it's actually a all included ecosystem where it can then fine tune the models, and we actually incorporate a little bit of active learning as well, so that they uh, label the correct documents that are most helpful, um, and then they end up with customized models that are best for their data collection. Um, and this is my final slide. Um, I just want to advertise a little bit about our upcoming task. I think <laughs> I think we might, might be very familiar with this because it's very similar to um, info tabs, right? Um, it's uh, so it's a upcoming sim of all tasks for next year. Um, we call it sim tab facts. Um, and the general idea is that given a table, in our case, we source from scientific tables um, from uh, from scientific papers. Um, and uh, a set of statements, can you um, determine from that table if it's um, entailed, refuted, or unknown, uh, or un unrelated? Um, and in addition to that, um, we actually have um, ev an evidence finding subtask where given the, your decision on a certain statement, you also have to tell us which of the cells in the table are instrumental in making that decision. Uh, to really uh, help with model understanding. And our statements are, we have a big mix of um, automated, automatically generated statements from templates and um, manually generated, and also actually some statements taken directly from the paper itself that the authors wrote. Um, if you're interested, um, please go on our website or just search um, STEM tab, fa tab facts, and um, it's one of the first ones that come up, comes up. Uh, we now just got the training data available, um, and then the evaluation um, is set to start um, January 10th, 2021. So there's still quite a bit of time, I think, um, and it, we'd love to see um, your submission if you're interested. And uh, that's it. Yeah, thank you all for listening, um, and really happy to take any questions. <laughs> yeah, we can have our virtual clap. <laughs> yeah, so thanks for the great talk. So if anyone have any questions, please uh, feel free to raise them in the chat or raise your hand in the in the participants window. Um, um, so for me, so, just that window, I have to. Yeah, yeah. So I can help direct them. So, um, okay, sure. so, so, so as people are th thinking of questions, so I've got a question. So, um, so. So if I'm writing a paper and and so I would like um, it to look good for the humans who are reading it, but 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 also the point of the paper is the is actually an archive of of the results. Well, what should I do for my tables to ensure that they'll be able to be kind of extracted and read when you know stuff is 
and to, and to make it easy, not just for humans to understand it, but mm -hmm. for computers to understand it as well. Yeah, that's a really well, interesting What's the trade? Well, I, number one thing I'd say is just make your table fully graphical line. You know, it'll look kind of ugly. Like, uh, it's almost like the uglier your table looks, the, the be easier it is for machines to understand. <laughs> um, so if you make it, you know, there's a graphical line between it for it, denoting every cell. Um, then, and if you want to make sure that table understanding can understand, you know, bold your headers, bold mm -hmm. your, um, your row header, your column header. Um, so, don't um, think so, like weird indentations. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so if I put those lines in white, is the, would you still be able to pick them up for, from the PDF? Um, mm, depends. I think most times, um, it depends on its PDF parser. Um, and actually, I think most PDF parsers um, will intentionally, if they see that the color is the same as the background, it will actually discard it because it stinks. Same with white text. Um, some will keep it and some will discard it because it assumes that you didn't want humans to see it. Um, so as of now, PDF parsers are still trying to replicate what humans see in that document. I mean, if you really want machines to understand it, publish it in HTML format. <laughs> oh, okay. So, 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 so doing tables in LaTeX is not does not necessarily make it easier. LaTeX, I think, is okay, um, but depends on. I mean, are you going to publish your LaTeX source? Uh, so if it's on the archive, then yeah. So. Um, true, I guess, but most people don't. I think retrieve that LaTeX source. Oh, you could, but. Yeah, I mean, there are, there's work out there actually, you know, making data sets from LaTeX. Um, but I think, uh, just kind of a sort of little bit off topic, but I, there was a really interesting um, paper I was starting to read yesterday that talks exactly kind of about that, where now a lot of companies um, in their financial reports are trying to uh, write for machines, not humans, because they know that machines are the ones reading it. So things like figuring out which words are going to have positive sentiment based on like sentiment analysis and NLP, <laughs> things like that. So it's very interesting. Yeah, so there's a question in the chat. So from Lynn Bacon, so do you imagine that there could be a kind of grammar of tables? Mm, interesting. So I think it'd be, I think there is an implicit, um, there is some syntax already, right? Like we have an understanding of alignment. If things are aligned together, then they are part of the same column, part of the same row. But beyond that, there's still a lot of um, variety that people can have. I think that there is a shared understanding between people most of the time on what the table structure is. And when we make tables, we kind of make it to that standard. But it's kind of similar to, if I were to ask you to describe a dog to me, all the attributes of a dog, then it's, it's hard, right, to figure out all of it. Um, so I think it's similar to those lines. And it would be, um, I think it would be as difficult, if not more difficult for me to describe, for a native speaker to describe, I guess, the grammar of their language to a non-speaker of that language. It's, it's almost like that. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, so there's another question, but, 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 but I have a follow up to that one. So, um, so it, it, in your work, do you try and assess the types of information stored in a table? Like whether it's like, uh, if it's, it's different, if it's a bunch of numbers, than if it's elements from a set, like it's a true false, it's binary or it's, it's Not my rhetorical. But we, in our group, we also have a focus on table understanding, and that's where they try and figure out which cells are headers and what the types of the content is um, for that cell, uh, sorry, for that column or row. Um, and even things like, uh, especially common in um, financial tables, there could be like in the corner somewhere millions of dollars. And you have to understand, does that millions of dollars apply to all the cells or some of the cells? Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of complexity there as well, but not I wouldn't say that it's, um, in the scope of the extraction work. So that doesn't kind of factor in to help the extraction. You're not using this kind of structured information of the 
type of content that could be in the tables that if it's, I mean, one column is all text description, you, are you looking for the explicit text? Do you treat that whole column differently? At that this point, no. I think um, I think some rule-based table tracking algorithms might do that. I would say that the, um, the object detection um, probably, or I think from my experience, the alignment is a stronger um, is a stronger cue than the the type of text because it's not uncommon for people to have different types of text inside the same column and row and it still be in the same column and row. Yeah. Okay. Great. So so there's another question from Austin. So so um so this seems so powerful for. So for automatically generating interactive so visualizations from papers, is this a possible downstream task? And um, Austin, if you want to clarify that. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind clarifying that question. Yeah, tabular data sets are very frequent in visualizations. Uh, you would need to know some of the semantics potentially, as Jeff was talking about before. But I was curious on, um, with these papers gener having uh, these tables, they could be viewed as some sort of reference or the data set for a visualization that could potentially be interacted with, perhaps aggregating on a column or uh, a row uh, based off of the user preference. I see. Okay. I, I think I see what you mean, like um, making kind I of. I also want to add, like, can we basically have the table and generate the graph, like? from this thing. <laughs> that would be great. I mean, I think the answer, like is, the answer is yes, right? I mean, Excel already does that, I think, when you have a table in their structure format. I think you can already make a, a chart from it, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I can see that. Like, it'd be interesting if we can have um, almost like live um, PDF documents, right? Like, um, you figure out what the elements are on there, and then you can play with it, right? Sounds like a great thing for Adobe to do. <laughs> Maybe we should um, reach out to them and collaborate with them on that. <laughs> but actually we do, we are already collaborating with them. I'll pitch it with the next one <laughs> in the next meeting. But um, yes, I, I agree that that would be um, very interesting. And I think, I wonder if there are things out there already kind of doing that, um, but yeah. Oh, thank you, very cool. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, Two questions. So first question is like, whatever you tested right now is mostly on like English data kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But like, what if we have language change or even like modality change, like having images? Yeah. So, um, so sort of um, a fortunate thing. Uh, so in Co in uh, ICDAR 2019, they actually have quite a few documents in Chinese. Um, as part of their data set. And from what I've seen, it works just as well as if it was in English. I think because our, you know, our um, model is more visual based and not semantically based at this point, the language itself doesn't matter too much, it seems like. Although I can imagine potentially for languages that go from right to left, maybe that could be more troublesome, but yeah. I have another question, uh, which is, so I know like uh, there was some work on IBM about table understanding of, 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 after table extraction. Mm -hmm. So do you have any update of which you can share a kind of thing? Because I am more into like table understanding, like, okay, of we course. have this table now. Right. Can, like, for example, the semi wall task, which you talked about mm -hmm. the inference mm -hmm. task. So is there any other stuff which is interesting, which you could do with tables? Okay. We now extracted them now. What's yeah, so we have in product. Um, so I think the table understanding is more closely aligned with product, and we don't have as much academic publication in that um, in that field. Um, but I can say that we are able to do things like you know header extractions and um, sorry header classification and um, and type um, classification of the column and rows, and um, also kind of what I was saying with the millions of dollars just getting, so for every cell, we can mark it with a lot of extra metadata. And then um, that can, and then we also have actually a table uh, question answering system as well. I was expecting that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> question answering. Yeah. So one more thing, like I have a bit of, like I've attended a few talks. I don't know, you know, like Sumit Gulwani, he also work on like program synthetic. 
synthesis like generating like automatic scripts for thing and they have this in power bi something like which is stable extractor but it's only work on html where there is structure given kind of thing oh okay in, 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 maybe you can check it out but the interesting part there is like they basically take any html page and there is like this structure present which is actually very easier task than this definitely because you know X, xml for an html have those markers which can help you out tables but then they can basically say, like wrangle the data easily so it's about most easy data wrangling with examples where you can see like multiple formats how you want to present that table or you want to get rid of something so maybe you can check out that thing because i like that interesting and i think with this it also can be uh, integrated because now you have the data and now if you can also specify like what you want and what you don't want out of data and how you want to present out of that so right you know yeah, i, so I think actually, the connection there but yeah yeah so i i helped a little bit in this but ibm actually just came out with a open source project and um oh gosh what is it called now numpy for but basically um it's to uh it's a larger library but part of it is actually uh to be able to um use what we extract from IBM tables to um, in be able to easily manipulate in a NumPy library. So I am, yeah, I'm forgetting the the name now. But when I, I, I can see if I if, if I find it, I can um, uh, ping you. But that that's I think also very helpful if you're working within Python. Nice. Yeah. Anyone else has any questions? Um. So, so, um. So I have one more question. So, so our team, um, so our, so there's a team at the library here who's got a big project on so constructing these, trying to take these old newspapers. They have like mm -hmm. scanned all of the newspapers ever ever published in Utah, um, and oh, they're, wow. they're trying to reconstruct them. And they've been focusing more on understanding the sort of the pictures in them. But have you have you applied? This yet to any of these like tasks to try and s say like digitize these like old newspapers or other sorts. Yeah, of that's a great tests. question. I mean, that's um, I think what we're doing now with our collaboration with the University of Reading on these um, old weather um, data documents, right? So um, let's zoom in a little bit here. Um, you can see that they are you know an old font scanned, um, but um, uh, but still a table and printed. Um, so we um, actually, um, so this professor, um, um, Ed Hawkins, actually, he's pretty famous for his um, um, climate change related visualizations. He actually reached out on Twitter um, just asking for help because all the um, systems he tried all really fail at this. Um, so we ended up um, reaching out to him and we tried our system GTE on it and he was really impressed by the results and so we're collaborating together actually on the UI that I'm talking about um, to help scientists be able to um, kind of customize our GTE model with a little bit of labeling for uh, different kinds of data and part of it I think part of our uh, goal is these kind to digitize old documents so I, I, I would be really interested in um, talking to you know if you have a point person or someone that is working yeah. on that. I yeah. So, so I see one issue here is that if, if you have a PDF, you know the table will almost surely be axis aligned perfectly, which mm. is not the case here with scan. Do you, do, you, do you try and correct for the rotation or maybe a skew from scanning? Yeah, so right now, um, we, we, um, that is one of the steps. But right now, the biggest issue is actually OCR itself. Um, a lot of the text itself, um, because I think it's a different font, and also there's some weird symbols around, um, that that's actually the biggest issue right now. But yeah, that's a good point too. When they scan it, you know, it's tilted and stuff. But that's something that even, because it's kind of a systematic tilt in their case, their books are all kind of <laughs> the exact same tilt. It's actually pretty easy to just like, for the special case, you know, <laughs> just tilt it a certain number of degrees. <laughs> Yeah, great. So, so I'll send you a so a contact with with our um, okay, kind of the head of the project at the library. Um, yeah, that would yeah. be really interesting. We can um, yeah, we can uh, discuss and I'll yeah. We were also just starting to talk to some other um, yeah. It seems like once we started working on this and the word got around that 
you know, we can help with digitizing documents. And I think it's great. Like I, I personally, um, my PhD project is very different from this. It's in computational neuroscience actually, but um, it was also about using data that normally was thrown away in, in hospitals, um, videos of patients and things like that. So I, I really like um, data rescue, I guess I call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you, I guess you have my contact information, right? So yeah, just let, let me know. And then I'll um, also loop in um, my manager and other people I'm working on. So we can maybe have a, maybe a call or something um, just to figure out if there's something we can work on together here. So on the uh, tiltedness, I think the, at least I, I know like this much reason, like it's kind of a handle problem kind of thing, at least the tilt and all like the screwness translation rotation and the sh uh, <coughs> shrinking and all is handle at the object level, definitely like in object detections and all. So I think like if we have enough samples for that thing also in this case, then we can kind of handle, I think in this table extraction thing also, I feel because I think in object, right. at least in vision, it's solved for objects like various angle pictures and all those things. So they're right. And I think this case, like I said, because it's um kind of a consistent angle for at least this this data set, it's you could just put in a rule. But um yeah, I I think yeah, I think it's it's a step that needs to be done, but it um right now it's not the largest challenge. Yeah, so there's another question from Sunipa Dev. Oh hi Sunipa. Sorry. Hi, Nancy. Uh, it's great to uh, listen to your talk again after ICDM. Um, um, <laughs> uh, I actually had a question about, like, following up on your domain specificity uh, comment. So can't part of that be resolved using the text surrounding the table? Like, if we were to understand the text that was accompanying the table, can't we sort of interpret the domain? Because... That might what um, mind, um just saying the the question in the beginning again. I, I think I sure. I uh, sorry. Uh, like you mentioned that uh, like talking to like specific scientists within different domains, we are able to like make this more applicable to different areas. So oh okay, mm -hmm. can part of that be resolved if we try to understand the text surrounding the tables or like. I think the bigger problem is not necessarily the text, the semantic content, but more so the styles of the tables and maybe the font, more of a visual issue. And also what... Um, but is that really different across different uh, domains or, or different areas? It's not areas domains, not, not scientific domains necessarily, because you're right, like most scientific papers, I would say, have very similar looking tables, especially if they all use uh, LaTeX or something. Um, but it's more so um, imagine things like invoices. Um, they're, they're a real mess. Like I don't have any examples in here right now, but invoices can have lots of different tables and sometimes they're key value pairs and some companies consider that key value pairs, some companies consider, consider that tables, some companies don't want that at all. So um, in that case, you really need to somehow customize it so that it works okay. for their downstream tasks. Okay. Thanks. I, I was just wondering if the text surrounding it would help us just make it more general from the get-go. But yeah, that makes sense. I think it Thanks. would, but the problem is there are always going to be new cases we haven't encountered before, you know. Mm -hmm. And also, like I said, two invoices could look exactly the same, but the customers expect different outputs. That could also be possible. I just want to add on uh, Sunipa one thing. It's like I think right now maybe we we could do like have more NLP component involved right now. I see like we are able to get a structure well and all, but there is still problem with OCR, which is kind of a vision plus NLP task, plus also like NLP, like our surrounding tests within same header, like what kind of text are there? So maybe having those models also in parallel with kind of a combination of this may be more helpful kind of thing. But I do agree like these things will not generalize because at least the table structure and all generalize across any tables you put from any things mm -hmm. across any languages also. But once you start putting all those things, then the generalization will also go away because then you are specific to that text, which is there in that table kind of thing. But yeah, that could be used for make, maybe making better for particular task or particular kind of data. That's just a comment or thought I have.
Uh, so great. So it's one o'clock. So so thanks a lot for the great talk. And so so thanks everyone for the questions. So let's thank Nancy one more time. Thank uh, you everyone. Um, and if you have any other questions or um, are thinking about potentially interning with us or things like that, um, feel free to email me. I think you have on the website or something, there's my contact, I believe, right? Yes. Um, okay. So we at least have your website. Um, I, I'm guessing we can find your email address. Yes, there's, yes, there. My, one of my email addresses is on there, yes. And um, yeah, and uh, please join the competition if you, especially um, someone that I know here who has a system already. <laughs> I will definitely participate, not directly me, but I've tried a few new things, so which I definitely want to try there, like especially the evidence row extraction thing. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see, um, especially the unknown as well. I think it's kind of interesting if you have to deal with statements that are not related and you have to decide that it's not related. Yes. I think that's actually really difficult. Good. Yeah. Thanks for okay. this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks.